um, Leah is someone who whose work, uh, the research really like explores the way politics influence the design of technical tools, and they do a number of games and technical projects that explore different ways uh, politics manifest in the in the design process. Really excited to see what Aliyah has to show us tonight. Give it up for Aliyah al -Katan. Hi, everyone. Let me make sure you can actually see this. Wait, wrong one, not good up. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you guys see these slides? -ish? Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Uh, really excited to go after five open projector legends and one emerging open projector legend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> welcome, Max. Um, I feel like I went through every single emotion. Like I was fully crying during Amal's presentation, even though I've seen it a million times, and I was laughing during <laughs> all of the others. Um, I, as uh, Todd said, my name is Alia. I'm from Cairo. Um, I was thinking earlier that I, I used to live right next to Tahrir Square where the Arab Spring happened, and now I live right next to Wonderful where Word Hack happens, and I guess <laughs> it, it is what it is. <laughs> um, but I, I'm a PhD student at NYU, and I, my research looks at mostly intersection between technology or emerging technologies and political communication. So I look at how we uh, find out about politics, how we participate in politics, how we communicate about politics online. Um, and then besides that, the kind of like other bucket of work that I do is mostly tech literacy work, so building interactive projects, games or explainers that demystify how technology works for more public audiences. Um, and typically these are like really two separate buckets um, of work that I've been trying over the years to have converge a little bit more. Um, so like my advisor, for example, would never know what I'm doing outside of the PhD, but now I'm owning it a little bit more. Um, and since everyone in this room, I think, is like, the people in New York City who love intersections the most. Um, <laughs> I figured, I, I figured, wouldn't be, wouldn't it be fun for the first time to give a talk that talks about both of my research and also my more creative projects and try to like show you guys how they feed into one another. Sometimes logistically, sometimes the ideas feed into one another. Um, and when I say wouldn't it be fun, I just mean for me personally, not really for any of you guys. Um, but we'll see how it goes. So this started kind of going on this path of. Uh, looking at more social political impact of technology it was like five years ago, I think now. I took a class in college called Politics of Code with Pierre actually, who Nick advised his PhD and so it's kind of funny, everyone is connected. Um, <laughs> but uh, I took it with a bunch of friends that I met in this class and every week we looked at a different political or social implication of technology and I just realized I should put on a, a clock, stopwatch thing so that I don't talk forever. Um, okay. Um, so we basically in the class had first learned about like AI bias and it was when all of these like big articles about AI bias were coming out. So my friends and I got together and um, we were all studying computer science and wanted to build a project that explained how AI decision making could be biased systematically to an audience that doesn't really know what AI is or how machine learning works. Um, so the website is live here. Um, this is the version of the explanation for why we built the project that I tell like in public spaces or to people who could give me money. This is the other version, um, <laughs> which is, <laughs> so my, my three friends, Miha, Gabor, and Jihoon, who I worked on this project with, were all two years older than me, and they just graduated that week. And they're like Slovenian, Korean, and Hungarian, and we're moving to, I don't know, Singapore, London, and Sweden or something. And so we were like, we're never gonna see each other again. And then my friend Miha was like, what if we apply for money? <laughs> and then we can hang out. Um, so also, we just wanted to hang out. Um, and so, let's see if this works. I, this is really important stuff. We succeeded <laughs> in getting the money. <laughs> uh, this is when we flew all of them to my undergrad, NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, to come back, and it was like our first reunion to work on the project together. Um, so this is what it looked like um, at the beginning. It was very ugly. Um, this is what it ended up looking like. So me has a really talented designer, so I think it's significantly less bad. Um, you can go to the website, survivalwestfit.com. I won't play through the whole thing because you don't have the time, but uh, oh, I should have plugged in sound, but it's fine. So essentially the premise is that you're playing as the CEO of a startup and you need to hire people. Um, 
So you go through this manual hiring process, there's a fire soundtrack, um, and you're accepting or rejecting candidates based on these CVs that you, oh wait, I forgot about this projector situation. There we go, wait one second. Let's, I don't know how to make this work. Okay, I think you guys can kind of see, it's fine. If not, you have computers, um, you can check it out. And so you accept or reject, I'm gonna need to start accepting people because I don't have time. Um, and then essentially it starts telling you, you know, good job, you're hiring, but you're not growing fast enough. Like the VCs want more growth, faster growth. And so your software engineer convinces you to use an automated hiring algorithm, which is like oftentimes how AI gets used, right? Um, and so we're not gonna go through all of these uh, levels, but essentially um, you, you start using the algorithm and it walks you through the process of like, this is how you would train the algorithm. It uses your manual decisions and then the data is not enough. Let's use Apple's hiring data or whatever. Um, and th throughout the course of the game, people hopefully like learn how uh, AI bias can manifest in this case in hiring, but also hopefully in like other use cases as well. Um, I hadn't like presented this project in a while and I went down uh, memory lane when I was thinking about what to say. So I looked through our like first group chat and I was looking at the media and I found my favorite review, which is um, Mozilla tweeted this like video they made of me talking about it and it says, how do we build more trustworthy AI? To me, it all comes down to accountability. Mozilla awardee Alia Kotlan builds survival the best fit. And someone named Christian Moore said, this is the second time in recent days that Mozilla has embraced a new Marxist ideologue <laughs> who believes that equality of outcome across all forms of intersectionality is desirable or even possible. <laughs> Sad to see an embrace of powerfully anti-capitalist and anti-Western activism. <laughs> I know. Which I actually like fully forgot that this happened until I like saw this picture. Which is funny because I don't think Survival of the Best Fed does any of this. But it would have been really cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so thank you, Christian Moore. And if you guys thought this is all he had to say, there was like a lot more, but we're not gonna get into it. <laughs> um, yeah, then there was like another like LinkedIn one, uh, woke bullshit, etc. I know, this, and this is the only two negative comments I've seen though, so it's okay. Um, and then actually someone saw David's post named Isaac and said, hey, this game is actually a pretty cool idea. And then Isaac reached out to us and he works in automated hiring and said, can we go on a call and talk about this? And we had a long call and we spoke about it and he went into the legal stuff and it was really, really cool. Um, so thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> I thought it would be more lame to say the more positive comments, but we actually, five years later this year, so a couple months ago, uh, Mozilla did an alumni, oh, this was funded by Mozilla Foundation, I don't know if I mentioned, but they did an alumni grant where if you've gotten funded before, you can apply for money again. And I haven't, hadn't seen my friends in five years because of the aforementioned countries. And I texted them and I said, hey guys, do you wanna hang out? Um, so we applied for a grant to make an impact report, which you can see at this link. Um, and I flew my friends from Sweden, Singapore, London. Um, and we met for the first time in five years and hung out in New York City for a week and worked on this. I took them to the best Kunafa spot in New York City, which is Sham Pastries on Steinway Street. So you guys should go there. Um, yeah, so that was the really best fit. It was really cool. We ended up, I like constantly meet students from all over the world who like had to use it in their like high school computer science classes or IT classes. A lot of people in corporations and government, um, a lot of like teacher education. So the project ended up doing really well. And like once every year, someone's like, whoa, indie projects, people actually see them. Um, yeah, but then from that project, that's kind of how I fell down the route of being really interested in more socio-political impact of technology and also more interested in literacy work. So more recently, and I presented this on an open projector and I know we have recurring guests here, so I won't talk about it too much. Um, but I presented an in-progress version of it and I worked on this game or like an explainer. People get really like territorial if you say the word games. I'm sorry, it's an explainer. <laughs> you can't win or lose. Um, called the algorithm uh, with my friend the giant who's like the coolest people, person you could ever meet in your life. Um, and let's see where it is. Um, so for the algorithm, oh, we had built another website first and this was like built over COVID just for fun really. And we had so much fun working together and so we were like, we should apply for money to also be able to work together again. So we built the algorithm which is, um, it's kind of inspired by this idea that the algorithm knows me better than I know myself, which we kept seeing recurring more often, like in pop culture, on social media. Um, 
So we figured out that one of the best ways to maybe educate people about that, what the algorithm is, is to use the same medium that they interface with what they think is the algorithm, which is typically like scrolling feeds like TikTok or Instagram. So this is our first wireframe, how it ended up. Um, and essentially what happens is you play through this um, fake like social media app and you're testing the app and it asks for your preferences. So you choose a color, shape, or speed. And we're not gonna do the whole thing because I know some of you saw it before. It says it's collecting data about you. And then essentially you swipe through this feed of content that is all like P5 animations. And I need to mention every time I show this here that most of them are built by Andy Wallace who had Particle Mace, I don't know if it's still here, but one of the arcade games here and is one of the all time greats of creative coding. Um, but you see it personalizing over time depending on your interactions. So like sort of show people feedback loops and how they work, but then also you see uh, screens that explain to you more aspects of how algorithms work, and in later stages of the project, which I won't get into, uh, it starts showing you the data it has on you, so you look at data transparency, you're able to change the dials of what the algorithm is weighting, like whether likes are more powerful or bookmarks, so you see user, user control a little bit more. So yeah, that was a fun project, just worked on it um, this past year. Um, and now we're working like in this stage of trying to build more lesson plans around it and figuring out how it can actually intentionally be used in more educational spaces. Um, so this is the part of the talk where I start talking about research more. So if you wanna leave the room, <laughs> this is your chance. Um, but from this project, um, it kinda ended up feeding into another project that is seemingly really unrelated. But essentially I had a problem with my PhD, which is that I, I'm supposed to be a social media researcher. <coughs> but I think Elon Musk hates me personally. Um, and so he, he shut down the APIs and we were like, oh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and so everyone was like trying to think of other ways to get data to do research on social media. And then the other thing that I was interested in is doing research that compares across social media apps, whereas most research just looks at one app at a time, uh, which is even harder to do when like all the apps have really bad data transparency and data access. Um, and I was interested in trying to understand how the impact of the way these apps are designed um, can change how we get access to information, process information, recall it. Um, and so I worked on this project that looks at different user interfaces. And essentially, uh, there's three like fake social media apps. One looks like Twitter, one looks like um, TikTok or Instagram Reels, but it's only text. And one looks like TikTok or Instagram Reels, but there's like animations in the background. Um, and every time I present research in like academic settings, I'll like plug in my laptop and start like showing them websites and no one cares, but I'm like doing little like open projector demos, <laughs> like show us the graphs. Um, but this was the first one. So just like a Twitter like interface and essentially you see um, a bunch of political news headlines. And so I had like participants online do this and they see a bunch of political news headlines across different political categories. Um, and then after you interact with it for a while, there's like a little quiz about what you remember, so it asks, asks you factual information about the headlines that you saw. Um, and then I asked people about their like political ideology, their political interest, what type of content they typically consume, and so on. So the first group of participants does this. The second group um, looks at this, which might look a little bit familiar, if you guys remember this one. <laughs> and so this was me being like, I don't have money to like, build stuff for my PhD and so I just repurposed the same exact code. Did I even bother like changing the color of this button, right? <laughs> like, it, like I put very minimal effort into pretending that this was original work. Um, but you get this interface that looks kind of like TikTok and I had the experiment only on mobile phones. Um, and so this is here, the same exact headlines you see here, but just in a different interface, right? And it's only text. So a lot of people, when they talk about TikTok, they say, you know, what's interesting about TikTok is it's video, it's funny, it's like the sound, the meme aspects, but like, it's like, it's extremely boring. Um, you just see the same exact headlines and you have to sequen sequentially swipe through one at a time. And then the third one is the same thing, but then there's like <laughs> P5 animation. <laughs> Which like I tried explaining this like to my like people in the department. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do like these little like Cody things in the background that just like colors and shapes and yeah. And like <laughs> for no reason, like everything is a little bit too randomized. Like <laughs> like it's randomized for the purposes of research, but then there's like randomization that I really didn't need to be doing, but I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you scroll through these headlines, and this is the third group, right? And so all three groups like each interact with the social media interface and then they answer this survey. Um, and essentially what I find, um, typically at like an academic conference, this is the slide that I use to show the results, but I've 
come to think of WordHog as kind of like a safe space, so there will be no regressions. <laughs> so you guys will not get to see what the numbers look like. Um, but essentially, uh, people are a lot more likely to pay attention to and remember content that they specifically that one that they don't already quite care about, right? Because I ask people about their political interests, how often they like consume political news in full screen swiping interfaces where you have to sequentially swipe through content, even without video, audio, funny memes, and so on. And actually, if you look at this one, the difference between um, these first two is almost like twice as much as the difference between these two. It could be because my animations are really boring, <laughs> but uh, it also goes to show that a lot of the impact is really just through the different design. And you can kind of think about it as like flashcards, right? Like when you're studying, having like pieces of information on separate flashcards. Um, is very different from like having it all in one piece of paper. But the idea is like to go from that and plug that into like broader questions about what kind of content that we consume and whether you're more likely to uh, be exposed to content that you don't typically care about on TikTok or Instagram than you are on Twitter or Facebook, for example. Um, but going from that project, which I partially built because I just built the algorithm and spent so much of my summer on it and everyone was asking me where my research is. So I was like, well, I already built the technical setup for my research, <laughs> and so that was what I was doing this summer. Um, but then I met this researcher, Chris Berry, who was also working on a social media clone. And he was like, wait, you built this clone? And I was like, yeah, totally, for, for research. And he said, I'm actually working on another clone, um, which is this one here. Uh, but the purpose of this one is, it looks also very similar to um, like a Twitter setup, or a blue sky one if you use that. Um, but basically we try to ask, because a lot of the research looks at um, how people interact on social media using like likes, follows, bookmarks, shares, and so on, so engagement signals. But there's a lot that engagement signals don't tell. So we're trying to understand how much data we're missing. And so we're looking at the difference between what people pay attention to um, and what people engage with online, which essentially means like what you're hate watching, right? And so to see what, what, we're, what we're not finding out through all of this like social media literature that's just looking at engagement. And so what we do essentially is that um, we have this platform, but then we have like some you know, data analytics in the background. And for every tweet, you have this read more button. And we're capturing the clicks on the read more button. And so we're seeing the difference between what you like. And people are instructed to like, like and retweet as they would on their typical social media platforms. Um, and so we're looking at the difference between what you engage with versus what you decide to read more and to see are people actually like looking at more content on the other side than we give them credit for because they look at it, but they're like, no one can ever know that I read this, right? Um, yeah, so essentially that was that project. It's still like kind of in progress. <coughs> um, and then last uh, word hack, I think Todd uh, gave a, a, a little spiel about his advisor in grad school maybe, asking him like, where is the language? So if you guys didn't know, the second L in LLM <laughs> stands for language. So <laughs> I think this is where I, I, I get my claim to talking about language. Um, now I'll talk about large language models and I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, I've, I reread Computer Power and Human Reason recently, which I think made me like really annoying for two weeks because I only spoke about it. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Weizenbaum like, um, was an NLP researcher in the 70s and made this chatbot interface called Eliza uh, that kind of like acts as a therapist, but it's actually super simple. Um, and then people like looked at it and they were like, this is amazing, this is gonna solve the healthcare crisis. Like we're just gonna replace all of the nurses with Eliza's. And then he was like, no, like don't do that. And he, like, <laughs> he, he, he wrote an entire book essentially explaining why we shouldn't do that. Um, it's really good, but uh, there was a line in the book at some point where he's talking about human conversations versus uh, like human AI conversations and he's saying when you're speaking to a human, there's a world of context that you have, right? And so you look at them and they kind of like maybe know where they come from, what their ideology is, you know, what they like, what they mean. And so there's all this context that you're attaching to information. Whereas if you're talking to like a conversational agent, there's just a void. And I read that and I thought maybe, but also like when you interact with open AIs, like chat GPT, for example, I think that I don't know, like a 40-year-old Kamala Harris voting white woman in the US would interact with it very differently than like my friend Sarah who's on Twitch, I think. Her dad's, um, her like Palestinian dad who's a software engineer is like interacting with ChatGPT, right? So he asked it a question about, I don't know, like Palestine and it says something like, he's like, no, you're probably wrong. I don't know what he actually asked it. But like, <laughs> there's a lot more skepticism that goes into it because he knows that ChatGPT is a product of an American company, uh, understands how data training works and all of these things. And so I started becoming interested in what ideological assumptions people make about chatbots 
and how that impacts kind of the levels of trust, skepticism, agency that you could even have in these conversations. Um, and then I was wondering, how can AI literacy change people's levels of, of trust and reliance? On LLMs, obviously, like, because I want them to have a lot of, like, very little trust and no reliance. Um, that's my agenda, but I am apolitical. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's how people in my department speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, and so, also, this is the part where I talk about stuff that doesn't really exist yet, but this is what I'm working on now, and things take a long time in academia. Um, but so this obviously like really comes from survival of the best fit where we learned about something and uh, we worked on this literacy project. I was in college when that happened. I was like a sophomore when I applied for the grant. Um, and now like I think I'm at a point where I'm doing research and I wanna work on literacy projects where I actually understand what the impact of it could be and know that I'm like doing it in ways that are more effective. Um, and so I wanna ask two things and one of them is like what literacy can do. So when you teach people that how AI bias works or how you teach them how the algorithm works or you know how an LLM works, what that can achieve, but also what it can do. And the subtext of that is like, we can't educate people out of everything, right? And like, I don't wanna fall into that trap of like Google saying like, we're gonna build whatever we want and we're just gonna give them educational tools about it because some things just shouldn't be built that way. Also, I hate Google. Uh, <laughs> that's for you, Zelda. <coughs> Um, and so the, basically this experiment that we're working on now, and this is like really rough design, and so if you have uh, ideas, let me know after. But basically we wanna have like four different groups of people interacting with these chatbots that we build. And essentially half of them are gonna be exposed to a literacy intervention, so like a little explainer explaining how LLMs work. And the other half isn't gonna be exposed to literacy interventions, we just interact with it right away. And of these two groups, each of them is split into two halves, and so one of them has um, a chatbot that is more human-like or like anthropomorphic, and one of them will have a chatbot that is like has a persona that is supposed to be a lot more machine-like. And this is because a lot of literature shows that people kind of like tend to um, humanize non-human objects anyway. And so if you have an anthropomorphic uh, chatbot, it could be likely that the literacy actually doesn't do as much, right? Because maybe like we shouldn't even think them that way in the first place. Um, <coughs> yeah, so essentially this is like kind of the design that we're thinking of. And um, I'm working on this with my friend Lujain, who I built the algorithm with, and so that like collaboration that was built off building this like public facing project now where it kind of has feeded into a collaboration on research. Um, and the idea for me and Lujain is to use these research insights to show, to build our next explainer, which will be like an LLM focused explainer. Nothing to show here because it doesn't exist. <coughs> but uh, I, I started this out by talking about like doing separate like research versus creative projects, and now we're trying to really merge them and do research that helps us understand how to build the creative projects properly, what to focus on, what to build or not build, um, where it's actually the most impactful. And so Lejai and I are starting this like little studio together um, where we do both research and also creative projects and hope to have them like feed into one another. And as of two days ago when I say starting a studio together, I just mean we have a domain name. <laughs> but, but as of yesterday, we got funded. And so we now have <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, so it's really cool. We now actually have a grant to do both of those things. Um, so we'll be working on that in the coming year, which is really exciting. So next, open projector eye. Come on, maybe I'll tell you guys about the next project. Um, that's it for me, and yeah.